Okay, well, welcome. Um, my name is Jeff Wilson. Um, uh, well, a number of engineering things. I, I trained as a double E, but over the years I've done a lot of digital circuit design, system on chip design, Gatorade, ASIC design, FPGA design, uh, as well as GPS, RF, uh, GPS layout, uh, RF systems. Um, 40 years basically engineering stuff. I'm not trying to intimidate anybody, but I am trying to say if you think you, there's the stuff I'm presenting is unlearnable, it just takes time. It takes effort. It takes some uh, maybe uh, key knowledge and insight to help at the proper points. And that's what I'm trying to do today. Uh, I wish I had a presentation like this when I was a young engineer because this stuff I had to learn hard, the hard way. So I'm hoping to make the path a little bit easier for anybody who wants to do a complex PCB design or just wants to make it productizable or makes, make it just really cool. All right, um, we'll have questions at the end, so hold until then, but I'll go on. So what am I doing in this presentation? This is not a schematic tutorial, really. There's a lot of those on the web, you can find them. Plus it, it would have to be dedicated to a particular package. They all have their quirks. So I'm not trying to teach schematic layout, I'm not, or schematic design, I'm not trying to teach layout. And it's not a step-by-step -step guide. What it is, is an attempt to cover the pitfalls encountered to those who are relatively new to PCB layouts and designs. Um, or for those who are uh, have done PCB layout uh, designs and they want to increase their skills. Because I'm, I'm going to skip through this introduction slide a little bit faster just because as we go on in the presentation it's going to come up in, anyway. Um, I am going to cover design rules, manufacturing, assembly, and uh, here's the big question for you all. Why do you want to do it? Uh, it's a uh, uh, I did it in the day because I was building things I couldn't get otherwise. And I know in the retro community, a lot of times that's the motivation. The board is no longer made. You can't get the adapter for your Commodore 64 that does the right thing. You can't get the PLA chip and you're building an adapter to replace it. These kind of things. Um, that's all very valid. Um, or it could just be you hate patch wire and cable boards and you want to build an adapter board. Or you want to create something completely new and innovative. Or Anyway, all of it's cool, and I would love to see some designs next year. If you've attended this presentation, come up and tell me, because I would just love to see the results of this. Going on. All right. So PCB topics. Um, do you, why do you want to do a design, and can just anyone do it? I'm going to skip this slide, because it's kind of a topic presentation slide, and I think I'm a little hot on the mic. Is, is that right? No, it's okay? All right. Um, I'm going to be covering PCB pro uh, properties, impedance matching, high-speed layouts, manufacturing steps. You see I'm already treading on a lot of ground here, so I'm going to do my best to go qu uh, quick and cover it, hopefully completely. Uh, FPGA topics, I'll be getting into FPGA architecture, schematic versus high-level design language designs, and cautions about open source uh, uh, modules and projects and AI designs. I'll get into that later. All right, PCB design. Can anyone do it? If you can read a schematic, yeah, you can. You might have some tool learning to do. You have to learn how to uh, build a schematic. You have to build a let net list. You have to learn how to input components and package and pins and do all of that. Uh, PCB manufacturing assembly has gotten incredibly affordable. I've put together PCBs that uh, I just needed. I, I used to hand wire cable adapters. Now I just throw together a PCB and I have it five days later and it cost me 10 bucks. <laughs> Is That's the level it's coming to. Uh, the, and if you're intimidated by assembly or soldering, you can also go many times get them assembled by the PCB houses. And, and if you choose from their catalog components, they, they'll do it and just not charge you any component uh, fee other than the cost of the component itself. So it's more accessible than it has ever been in my life. Right? When I first started, we had to print on uh, overhead foils and uh, do etching tanks and all of this really uh, yucky stuff to uh, build a PCB. And then we had to draw out the holes and we had to plate them ourselves. It was, it's a whole lot easier now. So I hope some of you all will be incentivized to take advantage of it. Uh, these are some PCB assembly houses I've used. They're not by any means the only ones. But I've used JLC, PCB, Next PCB, and PCB Way. Currently, my favorite is JLPC, JLC PCB because it's a one-stop shop for the stencils, for the printing, for the boards I do, 
And some of the unique characteristics I do is they will give me impedance match boards. And I'll get into a little bit of that later. All right. Well, sorry, too fast. Um, the tool package you use to do the actual layout is not necessarily the only thing you'll need. It depends on the complexity of your board. Uh, but that too has been made simple by the ecosystem today. There are lots of online calculators for calculating, uh, say, microstrip uh, impedance, maximum uh, trace width needed to handle a particular current, um, crosstalk, uh, there's a, a number of it, temperature rise because of a, cur a curtain, or sorry, current uh, situation that you just have to set to a certain size. You can predict how much temperature is going to be generated when you do it. Uh, there are also a lot of YouTube design videos and tutorials. Um, I will give a caution about YouTube design videos and tutorials. Sometimes you'll get someone who's learning along with you, and you may end up repeating their mistakes if they haven't really you know, planned it out and done it before. I and mean, it's great to see them go through the process, but you want to be careful, is, is this really everything I need to know before I start that? You know, am I going to take that advice and go run with it you know, without seeing where they got to it in the end? So just a little bit of caution. Be circumspect. It's easy to repeat other people's mistakes accidentally in that kind of environment. Uh, similar thing applies to FPGA uh, code, and I'll get onto that later. Uh, distributors and manufacturers. Uh, when I was in a young engineer, you just order parts from a distributor. They didn't give you any design help except for here's the cost. Nowadays, there are whole sections of design materials, reference designs on the websites of DigiKey, Mauser. You take a particular part, enter it in, and you can find design guides. So even if you don't have a reference to the schematic, you can build one a lot from what's been provided materials by the IC manufacturers. So make use of it. There's a lot of good information there. Um, GitHub. This is another great example. You can find projects that are pretty close to what you want, and you just want to modify a little bit. I'll get to give you the caution again, though. Some of those projects haven't really uh, been taken to their completion. You know, there's still bugs, there's still problems, they're, they're developing it, right? So take it as a caveat that it's not a finished reference, unless they say it is. Unless they say it's got, it's got to work and this is perfect, here's the layouts, great. Um, if they don't say that, if it's just a schematic and they're uh, moving along, then you might want to take some caution about any of the layout details that are involved. Um, you can get to online calculators for trace width impedance. We talked about this a little bit earlier. We're here, the direct links. EWeb has a ton of them. You can do buried strip line. You can do surface strip line. You can do uh, current calculations on interior layers if you're concerned that the trace and in in the interior of a board can handle the current you're drawing. All of that is available on these online calculators, so it makes it really easy. You, know, don't, you, you don't have to even put calculate anything yourself except know the PCB uh, dimensions that you're dealing with. Um, DigiKey has a great online set of calculators. It's not as complete as the eWeb stuff, um, and I think that's primarily just because they're dealing with uh, more generic kind of calculators, but it's still a very good resource. Um, let's talk about tools. Uh, when I was uh, engineering, I had to pay $10,000 for a CAD package. That gave me schema. I had to pay another $10,000 for the layout. <laughs> the tools nowadays um, have gotten very, very good. I used to look down on things like, uh, oh, um, Circuit Maker, Eagle Fusion, so on, because they couldn't do the flood fills. They couldn't do the uh, equalization of traces, some of the exotic stuff I was doing as a GPS engineer. But now all that stuff is really accessible and it's gotten really good. I'd say the best among the lot is KiCad. The problem with uh, Eagle Fusion and the rest listed here is they're produced by those companies as a pathway to a more expensive product. So like, here's the free, free version with limitations, right? But if you want those limitations removed, you gotta pay for the full product. So it's sort of a bait and hook. Whereas KiCad is free, just free, always free, big uh, library. It's done out of Europe as a uh, development consortium out of Germany. Uh, English packages, of course, you can read this in English, but it's, it's a pretty good solid state or solid and steady package. I can't re recommend it enough in this form. Personally, I use ORCAD schematic, ORCAD PCB version 10.0 because I paid for it and it still works <laughs> and I know it, but it's not transportable really. I can't take it to anybody's KiCad project, so that's a limitation on me. I, I'm, I'm going to have to t pick up KiCad at some point and I know it. Um, Hmm? It's not too bad and nice that you can use it with uh, Git repository. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's something that my package doesn't tolerate well. I've had problems. <laughs> okay, um, let's talk about PCB properties and materials. Uh, most people don't know that, well, they probably do or probably don't, but the classification of a PCB is a, a material known as FR4, flame retardant, and 4 refers to the dielectric. So why is the dielectric is important? Well, the dielectric tells us how much the material will be charged by electric fields around us, and it will also tell us how much it acts like a capacitor. This is important if we want to do strip lines. So I'll talk about how that is impacted later, but well, actually I got a fourth row on the slide. Anyway, um, so the permittivity is what is this ability to take a charge. That's permittivity. It affects a lot of things. I do GPS antenna design, and one of the things I always look at in the uh, GPS patch is what is the dielectric, what is the permittivity, because that will define for me the size it has to be to receive a particular frequency. Uh, High-speed interfaces, such as uh, USB, uh, low-voltage differential signaling, and RF tracks will be very dependent upon several factors here that relate to the perm permittivity. Uh, and that is the layer spacing, the track width, and the height of the copper itself. So think one ounce copper, two ounce copper, that has a specific height above the PCB. That actually affects the permittivity as well. So don't worry about those numbers. They, these, the online calculators handle that for you. Let me show here that you've got a uh, microstrate uh, pedance uh, calculator. You give it the... Sorry, it's very small on my screen, so I'm having a little trouble uh, going out. You give it the uh, the thickness of the copper layer, the spacing, the pre-pig spacing, if it's a multi-layer board, and put those values in, and it'll give you the width you need for a particular peak, uh, impedance. Or if you put the trace impedance in, or trace width, it'll give you the impedance that it's currently at. So this is pretty useful. Uh, why am I saying this? You're probably, I know a number of you aren't going to be using RF designs. You, you're not going to be doing our GPS RF layouts, probably. If you are, ask me, I'll help. But you're probably going to do things that are close to that. Um, USB, uh, 480 megabits per second. That's UHF. <laughs> That's UHF frequencies. Now you're, and they have specific impedance requirements. Um, USB is differential, so they have a impedance requirement of 90 ohms. So if you want that USB to go across your board and travel and be nice and quiet and, and work properly, um, you, you'll have to do a micro strip line to make sure it can run at the full 480 megabits per second. So that's one area. Um, another area, I don't know if you're getting into LCD displays or have you heard of LVDS uh, LCDs? If you have an LVDS output to an LCD panel, this is another area where you're going to have to also do the microstrip design. Uh, and lastly, yeah, you'll have to do it in RF, but not just uh, GPS. I mean, maybe you got a, a, a composite output going a long way on your PCB and you like it to be matched. That's another area where you do it. So one of the things I did not know when I was a young designer was Oh, what's microstrip impedance? I'm just going to throw some tracks around, put them down, make them. Uh, I need them high, uh, low impedance. I'll just make them nice and fat. <laughs> It'll work, right? You know, sometimes it did, sometimes it didn't. So knowing this beforehand, now you can figure out if you're going to have the optimized layout for what you want to do in terms of these interfaces. Um, that's one key aspect of getting some of these analog uh, high-speed and digital high-speed interfaces working well. Uh, the other area that you might face this is uh, uh, who wants to do uh, a, a DDR, DRAM interface? Anybody? Whoop, sorry. Okay, so there's a uh, differential clock signal there. If it's DDR3, it's, you can run in probably about 400 megahertz doing 800 uh, megabits per second double data rate for 1600 megabit bit, bytes per second. That's a lot of signal. Uh, that's a lot of signal changes. They have to be impedance matched. They have to be 50 ohms. They have to be equal length matched. And the clock, especially because it's differential, has to be length matched and impedance matched. Everything depends on those edges at those speeds. A little bit off and it doesn't work. <laughs> so anyway. Now, I'm not trying to scare you, so let me back off a little bit and say most boards below 10 megahertz really won't need impedance matching.
Mark, if you're just throwing 10 megahertz signals around the board, you're running a Z80 at 4 megahertz. Yeah, you don't need to do it. It's not required. Um, there is more of a point about capacitive loading, and I'm going to get onto this later. But the uh, unless you're doing very high-speed interfaces above 10 megahertz, then uh, you can ignore everything I said about impedance matching. But it comes in handy if you're going to have USB. It comes in handy if you're going to have any sort of uh, uh, video flying around, VGA video, 90 megahertz. You know, that's stuff that you will need to have impedance match to the 75 ohms of the VGA interface. So it can come in handy. Um, the reason I say it's it's probably not gonna matter too much though is copper is a very good conductor and can carry an amazing amount of current. As an example, a trace width of 13 mils. Anybody knows what mils are? It's, you know, 13th of an inch, very small. That can actually carry, um, with a one ounce copper, that can carry one amp with only a 10 degree C rise in temperature. That's pretty impressive. Now, is that a low impedance interface uh, or a low impedance strip of copper? No, it's not. But if you just need power for that, it'll work. It'll have some drop, but it'll work. So it's not a big deal. Um, you can use online cur uh, current calculators to decide whether what current's too much for a particular trace width. Like maybe you got something that's taken half an amp and you've only got space for 10 tal track. You can figure it out with the online calculator whether you're going to accept the resistance and the uh, temperature rise from it. All right. Um, this is another thing that is often ignored, or I shouldn't say ignored, but is a mistake when you encounter some uh, designs that are out in the wild. And this is annular rings on vias. So if you look at the process that a PCB is made, when they tell you that uh, the tra track and space width that their process is allowing is maybe six mil tracks, six mil spacing. That also means it needs a six mil annular ring around your drill size. So if you have a drill size uh, of 10 thou, that means you need 22 size annular ring because it's six times six plus 10 that gives you 26, right? So any whenever you're doing your VIA setups for your PCBs and you're defining these uh, elements, you're going to start with whatever track spacing you're trying to achieve on a particular design. Maybe it's cost-related. Maybe it's uh, current-related. You need big tracks because you're carrying lots of current, what have you. Any VIAs that you, holes that you drill, you want to make sure the annular ring is at least uh, meeting the minimum track, and, uh, track width requirement. It can be bigger, but can't be smaller. Okay. Now, uh, how many have seen four-layer designs where they have a power and ground plane in the middle of the board? Yeah, it's pretty common. It was a common technique when I was a young engineer. Why do we do it? it? Made ground connections easy. You didn't have to route them through rat's nests. You know, it made power connections easy the same way. Um, I do a modified version of this and not really ground plane. Um, the problem with the power and ground plane if you're doing high frequency circuits is it's one friggin' big capacitor. <laughs> FR4, it's a, it's a dielectric material, it forms a cap. So if you have high frequency noise on the power plane, it's going to couple directly into your ground plane through that layer spacing. It's not ideal for RF layouts, it's not really ideal for video either. If you have video where you're seeing the last little bit of luminance change, you probably don't want to do this. Either that or you want to isolate that section and make sure that power and ground plane are isolated from everything else. Um, so I generally don't design this way. What I do is I just use every layer of the board. But when I use every layer of the board, if I need microstrip in an area, I make sure the there's a ground plane under it or a ground plane over it or both. Right? I, Gen also generally track my power into my components. Why do I track them into my components? They already have decoupling caps at the component. If you're doing it right, it should, right? That's your noise uh, interface into the ground plane. That'll just make it localized to that device. And as long as your power tracks into your individual components are sufficient size and of low enough impedance, they themselves will not introduce additional noise. And they also keep uh, switching noise from directly coupling into your ground plane. So it's acquired aboard that way. Um, I'll get fights from people who are used to the power and ground plane thing, but if you go through the physics of it, this is what happens. Um, now, via stitching. So 
this is where if you if you have multiple ground planes you're doing floods for grounds everywhere and that's typically what i do uh, and you want to keep the whole board quiet um, you have to on a larger boards say you got a 12 by 12 board or let's make it maybe an s100 board because that's what i play with so it's like uh, 10 inches wide by about five inches tall um, if you only ground that ground plane on one side of the board you've just made a very nice little dipole antenna <laughs> between the planes because they're not shorted together there's some impedance across both matter of fact if you look at some of like the uh well um it's not the it's the 900 megahertz stuff they tend to do this with but you'll find 900 megahertz designs where they've printed a antenna on the board doing exactly this it's only connected at one point uh, so that's not a good idea. So what you do, though, is you do stitching vias. You try to stitch the ground planes together along the roots so that at no point on the board are you making anything longer than, say, a characteristic uh, uh, dipole antenna. Um, and it depends on the frequency of your boards. The GPS stuff I work on, I have to keep my via stitching to about 10 centimeters apart. Or, uh, sorry, 10 millimeters apart. Uh, and the reason for that is the short wavelengths or, uh, well, GPS wavelengths is eight inches and open air and copper is a bit less, but you get into the quarter wave, you're now down into the centimeter range. And I just want it to be really quiet. So the stitching can be very important for quiet boards. It can be very important for RF boards. Uh, it can also be important to the USB stuff we we're talking about. Keep noise off of those uh, USB lines as they get off your board. All right. Here's one I see all the time. <laughs> I do see this all the time. People love floods, ground floods, power floods. I do them all the time. All my boards are this. I mean, you, you look at my board and there's barely any stuff that's massed off the board that, because uh, everything is a ground plane around it. There's floods everywhere. So one thing that can happen though, is if you're not paying attention, you can flood uh, through all components and when you flood through old components, if you don't have thermal release enabled, it's just a copper flood right into the pad, you're gonna have a devil of a time solder into that sucker. <laughs> it's a big heat sink. It's just gonna suck up all the heat and you're gonna have a cold solder joint and it's gonna be very hard to rework. So whenever you're doing floods, pay attention to that. Do thermal reliefs on all of the through hole comp components, make your life easy. There is an exception for SMT components. Uh, if you're handling SMT components and assembling it yourself on the board, I'll get into little techniques about that later, you can do a full flood on those because the board heats up to the soldering temperature as a whole and it'll just solder to it, it'll be fine. But if you ever have to rework it, you might have some problems. Um, that's the only exception though. Uh, you can usually also find that um, if you, uh, KiCad, you specify this in various in the flooding uh, arrangement. You'll specify that you want uh, thermal reliefs. Sometimes in some packages, you have to go and specify which packages get the thermal reliefs. So depending on the package, you might have to look for this particular setting. But it'll be in there if it does floods. All right, this is where I usually build up a little bit of contention. Who's a conspiracy theorist? <laughs> Um, when I was a double E in college, we got trained about transmission lines. And what they'll teach you about transmission lines is you'll see this kind of waveform on top, right over here, as caused by the speed of light going down a wire, hitting the opposite end where there's an impedance mismatch, flying back to the source and causing it to dip and then to ring and the dip and the ring and the dip and the ring. So, People see traces like this on a scope on their board and they say, oh, I have an impedance matching problem. Hmm, not really. Here's the reason. Uh, take the average board that's, uh, I'll make my math easy. Maybe I get a board that's 12 inches wide. Speed of light in copper is one or 12 inches per nanosecond. If you're doing this like this is with a, a separation is what? Uh, 100 nanoseconds per division, you cannot tell me that peak there is a one nanosecond pulse coming back. <laughs> that doesn't happen. The onboard uh, waveforms where you're getting this ringing is more of a capacitive effect. What's happening is the output drivers are strong. TTL is 20 ohms output. They're strong. They, and they, when they're 
asked to drive high and they're already at a low potential, they're sourcing the most current they can to get to that high potential. It actually starts providing current before you ever see the voltage waveform move. And this current just peaks all the way up. Well, it actually falls off a little bit at the top. I didn't draw it too well. But it peaks as it reaches the top and holds it there and then falls off as everything, as you've charged the line. You've, you're basically charging a line of capacitors. That's all t uh, TTL and CMOS inputs are. They're capacitive gates, right? So when you charge that line, say you got 10 TTL loads and you've charged them all up, what happens when you stop charging capacitor? Have you ever seen this on a, a trace when you charge a capacitor, let it go, what happens? You get this back impulse and the voltage climbs. So that's what exactly is what is happening here. Well, what happens next? As it climbs, the gate is still, it stops driving it, so it falls all the way down. And as it falls below the potential where it wants to drive to, it starts driving again. And you start charging the cap again, but it's not as much current this time because it doesn't have as far to go. So it sends less current in, that goes down the capacitive line, it gets less overcharged, and then the next waveform starts again, and it goes through that cycle until it settles out. So it's really a capacitive effect when you're dealing with things on the board at these frequencies, right? You're, you're not gonna have a hundred uh, or a uh, one nanosecond, well, you're not gonna have a 12 inch board produce reflections that are gonna make this thing oscillate for 10 nanoseconds or five nanoseconds. It's just not gonna happen. <laughs> so um, what was the alternative to this? How do we solve this? The problem is the overdriving. The problem is all the TTL stuff doesn't know when to turn off. It doesn't know when it should be done. It keeps driving hard, hard, hard. Uh, if you look at the, I don't think TI makes them anymore, but they used to provide parts where they had integrated a 25 ohm resistor in the output drives of the TTL parts. This was a special family. It was precisely for handling this condition. It's so that you wouldn't overdrive uh, the outputs, right? And if you needed to drive a big bush with a lot of capacitors, well, you could switch to the part without the series resistor. So what am I getting to with this? If you have problems with ringing on your board, you know, look at the output drivers, look at what they're doing. Sometimes you can solve it with an inline series resistor. I was taught that the way you solve it is you put a, a resistor and a cap to ground. Well, the problem with that is now you're just taking that energy that was going to go into a gate somewhere and you're just dumping it into the ground. Nowhere else. So if you're doing that with clocks, high-speed circuits, you're making your ground noisy. But sometimes it works. If it's all digital, okay, fine. <laughs> I'm not going to argue about it. it. It slows the edges. It will raise your noise floor, but that's okay if it's an all-digital design. It's just something to be aware if you're doing audio, if you're doing uh, high-speed video, these kind of things. All right. So PCB layers. Um, the Native uh, impedance of most digital and RF systems is 50 ohms. I could go into why this is, but I think, uh, I'm, again, I'm not trying to teach the math here. I'm trying to teach some principles. So if you go, I did provide a link to the article, and by the way, if anybody wants to contact me after this talk, I will be happy to take an email address and send you this presentation. So I'll be happy to publish it as is. Anyway. Um, if you can go research this whole impedance thing yourself, but typically you're going to find that 50 ohm impedance is kind of the standard RF impedance for everything except video and cable TV. Why is that? Well, it's because the dielectric to achieve 50 ohms is more expensive than the dielectric to achieve 75 ohms. And when you're stringing miles and miles of coax cable to provide cable TV to customers, you want the cheaper option. That's why it's 75 ohms. There's practically no other reason. Um, so it doesn't matter. If we need to match the 75 ohms, we match the 75 ohms. If we need to match the 50 ohms, we match the 50 ohms. And these impedance calculators will do that for you. Uh, if you're going to do the TTL logic, you're trying to match it to 50 ohms. Like I said, it's native output. Uh, impedance is 20 ohms. So use a 30 ohm or 33 ohm resistor in line. And that if you ever wondered, if you look at some schematics where they're driving like DRAM and so on, you see a bunch of 33 ohm resistors in line. This is the reason. All right. And I think we already talked about uh, the rest of the classic uh, impedance. Oh, uh, and if you're doing uh, Wi-Fi and, and most other RF, you know, Bluetooth, so on, all of that's 50 ohms as well. 
So it's only the video stuff that tends to be the 75 ohms. Although someone will prove me wrong, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. Now, we're going back to this. What do we do about fixing this impedance problem? Do we do, the classic way was to do active termination. Like my CompuPro that I had in the hall here had these regulators driving a midpoint on the bus and resistors to that midpoint, right, from, for all the signals on the bus. That's called active termination. So what it's really doing, though, is it's loading the output driver. It's bringing the, it's draining off some of the excess current that the output driver is producing and shunting it into ground so that you don't end up with this ringing waveform. As, now, it doesn't have a lot to do with, uh, like I said, sp uh, speed of light impedance matching. It has more to do with the capacitive load on the line. Um, anyway, that's the way they handle it. It can be tricky. Uh, I've seen people argue about what that voltage needs to be and just a little bit and things fail. Uh, the other thing is passive termination. This is where they use a resistor to a positive supply and a negative supply. Like they one to five volts and one to ground, I shouldn't say negative, and do a midpoint with the resistor set up and that's passive. And it's passive because there's no feedback on the voltage output to it, whereas the active has like an op amp that drives it to keep it at a particular voltage for the midpoint match. Um, both of those were used classically. Uh, Apple and IBM use the passive stuff on their buses because it's easy. You know, it's there. Um, and their buses were short, so it was fine. Uh, when you're getting into longer buses and larger capacitive loads, though, it gets harder to keep matching in. When you, like, you take one board out, things change. You know, this, you've heard of slot sensitivity where you move a card from one slot to another. Typically, this is because... Your, um, the slot sensi sensitivity is due to the fact you've changed it to a different path of impedance. You've lowered its impedance or increased its impedance depending on what slot relationship was to where the impedance or the matching resistors were, the termination resistors. Um, what I prefer is series termination. And for, as I said before, is because it lowers that current spike at the beginning of the pulse. It allows to charge, but it just lowers that initial, you know, 20 ohms of, you know, output bang and keeps it down. Um, I built an S100 uh, motherboard that fits in an ATX uh, chassis, and I uh, put a 15 ohm resistor down to a common bus and a 15 ohm resistor up to the next connector on every single connector on the bus. So when you're driving it, the output driver saw 30 ohms to every card. Uh, I had a, we have a, guy in our S100 team who loves PD8s on S100 bus and he couldn't get his cards working. He put them in this bus and he saw perfectly smooth termination lines and everything worked. You know, the signals were, weren't ringing. They were, it was great. And it was primarily because, again, the output drivers were overdriving. Um, barring that, you know, there are parts you can buy that actually have active slew rate control inside them. They'll, they'll control their own current output, and they'll say, okay, I'm overdriving this too much, so I'm going to slow down. Um, you'll see it listed in the day sheets sometimes, you know, slew rate uh, control, and they'll list it as volts per nanosecond of slew rate control. They'll list it in a, that kind of time frame, and it tells you how much the device will allow the voltage output to change in a particular nanosecond time range. So if you can find them, they're great. You don't have to do anything on your board. You don't need any series of uh, termination to handle these lines. You just... Use them and they're great. Um, the problem is they're not common in TTL. They're not common in a lot of the older CMOS devices. So you may have to take your do do the series termination anyway. But if you can find them, they're a great option. I will say that the FPGAs tend to have slew rate controls. So if you're building and designing an FPGA and you're driving something, uh, you could probably do without the uh, the series resistors because you can set the appropriate drive strength for that line. So that makes it a lot more efficient on the FPGAs to do this kind of capacitance load matching. Okay, moving on. I'm going to try to leave times for uh, <laughs> for questions, so I'm going to start speeding through some things. All right. Um, so single ended versus double ended uh, ended signals. Uh, I'll I'll kind of bring this down a little bit. Everybody knows uh, VGA is single ended. That's fine. Double ended is DVI. HDMI, USB, LVDS, and all W ended means is it's got a positive and negative. It's basically trying to remove the common mode noise from the signal by giving you both a positive and negative version of the same signal. The advantage of that is you can kind of ignore the noise that gets on the line pretty easily. 
Uh, you do have to recognize that because of the way it's operating, it's not driving against the ground plane like single winds are. It's actually driving against itself. So the impedance matching for these differential lines are typically double of what the single winded lines are. Um, USB is a little bit of an exception. It's 90 ohms instead of 100. But, and DVI the same way. But most are 100. Uh, uh, excuse me. 100 ohms for double. Um, you do have some mixed signal devices like SDRM I was describing before that the clocks are double-ended, but the address and data lines are single-ended, but they're double data rate. You still want to take care on those that they're matched. Um, I did a design on an FPGA where uh, even though I had slew rate control on the uh, outputs, because it was kind of coarse, it was only four levels, um, I still put some series termination resistors in line so that I could have some options if it, if the slew rate control, I couldn't adjust it fine tuned enough for the DRAM layout. Um, something else you'll have to do with these, uh, you, if you're driving a DRAM layout at, uh, let's take DDR3 at 400 megahertz, you have to impede or, um, sorry, trace match the length of the lines to them because the sidles, slight differences between trace lengths start adding up meaning the bits aren't arriving at the same time at the DRAM. <laughs> they miss clock edges. You start having skew problems. If you'll look at this design here, this is a DRAM design. If you see all this oh, curly you know, racetrack kind of thing going down, that's trace length matching for the shorter traces. And I did that in that design to make, make sure everything was going to line up. So if you're doing especially double data rate DRAM, that's something you need to do. Um, this top design is a hyper RAM design that was 200 megahertz, so it's not the 400 megahertz design this was, but this 200 megahertz design. But I still trace matched it because I, it's a double data rate and I wanted to keep everything tight. So just be aware if you're going to do DRAMs, these high speed interfaces, that's something you'll probably have to do. A lot of the tools have a way to measure the trace, uh, trace length and adjust it if you need it to. Some, some of the auto routers will allow you to tell them the trace lengths have to be this and they'll go, they'll go ahead and do this kind of routing for you. Just depends on what the package is. Um, I do caution about overusing auto router routing setups to begin with. Because it's very easy to throw a netlist at an auto router and pretend, okay, it must have done it right. Well, no, it's just making decisions to route. Okay, I can put a trace here if you haven't specified the uh, impedance the trace had to have, or its length, or it's if it's going to be uh, impedance matched to an interior layer or an hour later. Uh, the auto router is just going to do whatever it wants. So for first designs, if you're getting used to doing this kind of thing, do it yourself. Just route it yourself, get used to how it's laid out. You'll, you'll find that actually it'll make you better at placing components later on because you'll have a few false starts. You'll place some components that looks like a good layout. You'll start routing and going, oh, crap, this sucks. <laughs> you know, rip it all up, move things around. Okay, that's better, right? Now, when I see this bus goes this and this and this, oh, yeah, let's put this in a line over here, right? You get better at component placement for learning about how the routing goes. So I encourage you to first few times out, do your own component placement. Don't depend on the auto router. All right, uh, where are my page numbers? Okay, doing all right, I think. Um, I'm going to be real quick on RF layouts because I got a feeling there's how many people want to do RF layouts? Is there any? There's one? Have to? <laughs> <laughs> um, I fell into it when I got started working in GPS about 20 years ago um, and it was an eye opener. But I'll give you a few rules that really help. Um, remember that micro, you'll need microstrip techniques to do impedance match signal paths. You can't just have the components do the impedance match for you. You'll get a schematic that says, okay, this, these components are matched to 50 ohms. Oh, that's great. But if you don't have the traces also matched to 50 ohms, you're going to have an impedance match. So you have to do the micro, uh, microstrip design on those. Um, this is the one that's always a failure. You got to remember ground is a return path. No signal goes out unless ground comes back. If you optimize the output path, that looks great, and you've got a thin trace on the ground, it isn't going to work. <laughs> you gotta, you got to have a recognition that the uh, return path current has to be clear and low impedance and all that. As an example, this is an, a GPS design, so this is probably more extreme than most of you are going to want to deal with. But what it's doing is it's taking an RF here, running it through a 
impedance match track on the back side of the board to this matching network here. And it's split off because one side is providing uh, some power over here to an LNA, and the other side is the signal path. So the signal path is matched for the strip line. Sorry? My right cursor's not showing up? Oh, it's because it's, right, thanks for bringing that out. I am so sorry. Ah, here we go. I do have to turn my head. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. Let me start that again. <laughs> now if I can control my mouse sideways. <laughs> well, that's it. This is a coordination test, isn't it? <laughs> All right, so here's the RF input for this module. It goes down to a, a back side of the board where it's got a microstrip design. Oh, dang, this is tough sideways. <laughs> Hello, where did you go? Okay, where it goes to an input over here. And this is a, a matching network, uh, network for matching the input impedance of this LNA down here. Um, so it gets tracked to here, hits another, uh, uh, hits the LNA and does the, um, uh, goes to an output matching network and is fed finally to the input of the GPS receiver right here. Notice the count return path from the GPS receiver. It's equal to the size of the input path impedance wise. Has to be. It can be e either equal to the size or bigger. Ground can be bigger. The signal input path doesn't can't be, but the ground can be bigger. Then I have put stitching vias everywhere, <laughs> right? Because I want very little voltage differential on the, all of this stuff. I want to protect it. Here's another thing about RF circuits. Don't share the ground planes. Don't share them with a the digital plane. You're just going to inject noise. Notice what happens to the ground that comes up here. And if I can get my cursor there. <laughs> um, this center pad is a ground is a digital ground plane. I've got one single point connection to it. That's how you do RF layers. You connect them at a single point where you think it's going to be closest to wherever the input's going next. Like if it's going into a front end of a, a radio or something, there's usually you'll notice in the pinouts of those things, they'll have a ground pin right around that input, and that's where you attach that RF ground. And it's not attached anywhere else. All right. All right, so I do recommend if you're going to do RF, find a good reference schematic. Am I hitting time? <laughs> okay. Uh, find a good reference schematic. They're going to be in the data sheets of the components you're trying to do. If you find a GPS receiver data sheet, they'll probably have a reference design in there about a front end, how to do it. Uh, if you're trying to do a, a Wi-Fi uh, one, they'll have a reference design with suggested matching components. Just follow it. I mean, they put time into that to make it work. Um, do be careful with the impedance of the traces. Do be careful with the component lo locations and where the ground points are. And if you do all of that, you probably can, you'll probably have a good design. It'll work. All right. Uh, another thing that they never tell you about with Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and it drives me crazy. <laughs> uh, how these uh, receivers work is they take a common oscillator. Maybe it's 26 megahertz, 25 megahertz, what have you. And they do go it through, put it through a PLL to get two and a half gigahertz out of it. Okay, great. You know, I only need one little crystal and I get my Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. This is great. Everything's happy. Well, that TCXO is usually about 0 0.5 ppm tolerance, something like that. Uh, when you have thermal disturbances on the board, that is going to shift. And it's going to shift quite radically. And you'll, what you'll find is you'll, you'll sometimes lose lock. You'll lose frequencies. You'll lose reception. You want to protect it. I usually do either, if you look up here. Yeah, I have that cursor problem again. Where, where are you? Look up here. I've got, this is a uh, shield can. That's my TCXO right there. So I'm shielding it from air currents. And it's not only uh, air currents. There are three heat conduction pathways into a TCXO or a crystal. Conductive, radiation, infrared in other words, and convective, air. So the my shield can here protects me from most of that except the conducted. Now the conducted I got to do design-wise. Notice there's no floods in here. <laughs> I'm making my traces thin because I don't want to heat from other parts of the board injecting into the TCXO. So protect the component and you'll have a stable, uh, say, Wi-Fi transceiver. It'll work better for you.
Um, also, if you're providing voltage to any of this RF running components, don't p depend on switcher outputs. <laughs> you're laughing. I think you've, you must have encountered this. <laughs> Uh, switches are good at producing, the, you know, a 3.3, you check it with your voltmeter, looks great. There's a lot of switching harmonics on those things. You in, a lot of harmonics. You, pump, you put that into your RF, it's going to mod, co-modulate your RF into strange noise states. It just happens. Um, if, I recommend usually having a separate low dropout regulator just for the RF components and making sure that the... Uh, so, the noise rejection in the 100 kilohertz range is at least 40 or 50 dB. You can find these specs on the regulators themselves, so if they're a good one. If they're a knockoff and they're, I don't know, a, that out of the back catalog of a surplus magazine, I probably wouldn't depend on it. <laughs> but So that's the range you want for a clean RF supply to an RF chip. All right, I think, oh, inductors. Yes, I didn't cover that. Um, the reference designs will commonly in, uh, include inductors, right? Uh, and it's look like, okay, maybe I need uh, a 5 nanohenry inductor or I need a 2.2 nanohenry inductor in the RF patch for signal matching. Do you think it's okay to use these paste inductors? No, they're crap. For our, uh, The problem with paste inductors at microwave frequencies is they turn into resistors. <laughs> They do self-residence. They have a very low self-residence. What you want for uh, an RF path is to have a high Q, is what they call it, a high Q inductor. And these are always wire round. So they're, they're not paste. They're not ferrite. They're wire round. So you look for wire round inductors for anything that's going in the RF path, except for maybe... I'm not talking about VCO tuning coils, <laughs> sorry, but uh, for any high frequencies, you definitely want the high Q inductors. Okay. Uh, now we're getting the manufacturer. Okay, we designed this. We followed all these rules. We got the perfect, you know, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth. It's going to output video VGA and for plus on the side, give us a DVI. <laughs> now we got to build it. So now we just have to generate the output files. And this, uh, this is a little bit of the PCB training that I said I wasn't going into, but I just wanted to point out that it's easy to forget layers. You know, we think it's just top, bottom, copper. Yeah, it's all we need. No, you need silk screen. You need solder mask. If you're going to have it assembled, you're going to need solder paste. Um, if you're going to have it assembled, you need to give them component file, uh, component files where the locations are of the components, what the component part numbers are, how they reference into your bomb. There's a lot of cross stuff that goes on there. Uh, you have to have NC drill files. Okay, everybody says, okay, great, there's a drill file for the VS. I only need one. Um, no, you need two if you're doing non-plated through holes. You'll have one drill file that will cover all the holes that are plated, and you'll have another drill file that will cover all the non-plated holes. I've seen so many boards where uh, a non-plated hole was called for and no one knew how to do it, so they just put a plated hole there. <laughs> and this is usually with screw uh, things, right? <laughs> where you're trying to make a mounted screw that's electrically isolated and maybe you accidentally ground flooded it and now you've got it connected to the board and you're shorting things. No, you can do non-plated holes and that's where, that's, that's where it comes in. Uh, panelization for assembly. Uh, Panelization nowadays, when I when I first started doing it, the PCB house did not panelize for you. You had it back and forth. How big is your tray? What what size do I need for the panel? What's the separation you need? And all of this, it was a whole rigmarole. Now you go to someone like JLC PCB and you say, I want it panelized, and they'll say how many individual parts you want on the panel. You tell them, and they say, fine. <laughs> They'll send you back a check plot, but they'll say fine. And if it's really large, you may only get two on a panel, but it you know, depends on what you're building. But they take care of it for you. It's all good. I'm going to give, we can have a question and answer session now before we get into the FPGA stuff, but I'm willing to run over because um, I want to run through the FPGA and kind of do all the questions at once because I feel like I, I'm running over and I know it. If that's okay with everybody, I'll run ahead. Okay. Uh, how many people think that putting uh, a design into an FPGA is just like copying the board schematic and putting it in the FPGA? Good. No one raised their hands. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I follow a few uh, Mr. Project developers. 
uh -huh. like Bottego, and uh, uh, like it, it's it, there's a lot of bug fixing and such. Well, let me help you avoid that. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, let me. You're talking about bug fixes and FPGAs. Let me help you avoid some of that. Uh, what's happening is when you do that, uh, th say this is a classic thing. Um, well, before I get into it, let me talk about what the FPGA architecture looks like to begin with, and we'll, then it'll make sense as to what I'm going to propose. So FPGAs, one, there are no tri-state buses inside an FPGA. None. Zero. Zip. Nada. <laughs> you can't tri-state any signal inside an FPGA. The way you handle buses with multiple components is the output can go fan out everywhere. That's fine. No contention there. On the input side, what you have to do is put it into a big MUX. You got 20 possible bu bus components on your bus. You have to have a 20-way MUX. That's the way it works. That's the only way to do it because, you, again, you don't have tri-state. Now, the next issue you tend to run into with that is... Um, the only tri-state area is at the edges, it's at the pins of the FPGA, so now you've got to handle that as you go out. But uh, let's go back to the core for a second. This is where i got to go sideways. Oh, this is large. <laughs> Where's my cursor? I'm thinking I should... So does the laser pointer not show up? <laughs> I feel like I should have done a dry run with this setup. <laughs> Where did, okay, there it is. Fine. You got an internal core of logic blocks. And these logic blocks can look a lot of different ways. And the Infinix FPGAs I've been using lately, they've got a four input lookup table, an adder, a flip flop, a uh, lookup table output, a carry output. All of this can be uh, in that particular logic block. I want you to notice one thing you got a clock, and you got a clock enable. Okay, the clock enable is going to become very important. I'll explain why in a couple of slides. Um, you also have hard cells. If you think you're going to lay out a 400 megahertz uh, DDR3 logic block interface and have it work on an FPGA PGA structure where you're having picoseconds of timing skew to match, no, not going to happen. So the FPGA manufacturers, what they do is say, okay, you want DDR or DDR3 or DDR4? We'll give you a hard cell that does that. You just have to talk to it. All right, thank you. All right, so this, uh, for example, bit of memory is a hard cell. An uh, SD RAM interface is a hard cell. Multipliers are hard cells. Why are they doing that? Because they can make them small and make them efficient, and you can use a lot of them if they do it. So it's an advantage. Hmm? Because they can use an ASIC there. An ASIC? This is an FPGA, though. Yeah, but for the hard cell blocks. Oh, yes. Um, they actually are... Yeah, it's not so much an ASIC usually because with, especially with the DDR stuff, it's actually a, just a, a, a direct in-process design, right? It's a custom piece of silicon. Uh, if it were ASIC programmable, it would probably you'd have metallization layers on top that you could change and move and so on, and uh, the timing's too tight on those things. All right. Um, so let's look a little bit about what the I.O. looks like. So this is where I was saying the only tri-state is off-chip. This is off-chip over here. Here's another thing to notice. If you have a part that's doing double data rate, this is why we have two flip-flops. And the input path and output path. Okay, why do we have three? Well, it's for crossing clock domains. It gives you a buffer stage to cross, cross clock domains. Right? Uh, the design tools mostly figure that out for you, so you don't have to worry about it, but it's something to know. All right, and phase lock loops. This is the one that everybody gets wrong because they go, I'm going to buy this FPGA. It allows me to take an external clock and just run it to everything on board. So I'm just going to go to do that. I don't want to set up the PLL. That looks hard. Um, if you don't, you lose some of the advantage of a clock tree. And I'll talk about what that means. You also lose flexibility. Uh, you also lose timing uh, stability. Your external clock is probably not as precise as this PLE, PLL is going to be. The PLL is characterized by the manufacturer to have very tight timing constraints. 
and they know the timing constraints. So when their synthesis tool uses the PLL, it knows exactly what the skew is going to be. It knows exactly what the propagation delays are going to be, and it's going to build a timing model internal to fit your part or your design on their part. You don't have the work to do if you use the PLL. If you provide an external clock, you it's going to add in a whole bunch of things to say, I don't know what this clock is like. And I'm going to try to uh, set this clock up so it'll work, but it's going to have a lot of guard band. It's a lot of tolerance. It may not fit. Okay. Let's talk about clock trees. This, if I give you no other idea about FPGAs today, if I can get across the concept of clock trees, I will consider this a success. Here's the reason. Um, if you design a circuit board and you've like, uh, take a, and I think I do this on the latest slide. If you are writing a latch, you've got a, let me see, I think I've got it uh, here. Yeah, let's do it here. No, that's transaction model. Never mind. I'll have to do it here. If you create a latch on a bus, you're, you're trying to write a latch on a bus. You've got an address decoder. You've got some bus state decoding. You've maybe got some other things. Is this a read or a writer? Is this, a, you know, do I have other special boundary conditions to w whether I'm going to write this latch or not? And then finally, I produce a signal that says, yes, I want to write this latch. Well, where do people mostly put that? They put it into the clock pen of something like a, an 8-bit latch, right? Well, what you've done is you've added a lot of combinatorial delay to that clock edge up front. What if PGAs do, and it's uh, right here, is they provide a very fast clock distribution scheme to every logic plot on the part. On the Phoenix parts, these things have something like um, uh, half a second, half a nanosecond of skew over the whole device. Very tight timing. So the, the synthesis system knows this. And when it's doing uh, logic designs, what you would, if you, instead of producing a clock to do that latch, you produce an enable. Now, I don't care how long the enable is as long as it meets the setup time of the clock, the master clock across the bus. So when I showed you that they had an enable pin on that logic block, this is the reason it does. You can prove uh, it's basically for enabling pipeline architectures. You can, and because the synthesis tool knows the component delay of each of those logic blocks stacked up together, it can route to best efficiently fit that within the time frame of your PLL clock. Because when you do your PLL clock, you're going to tell it what frequency it is. And say you're doing 100 megahertz and say, okay, I have 10 nanoseconds. I got to fit all this logic enable for this clock on this stage within 10 nanoseconds and it works it out. And if it can't do it, it'll throw uh, an error. It'll tell you there's a problem. Uh, what do you do if there's a problem like that? Well, pipeline it. You make another stage. Put half of them in one stage, half of them in the second stage. So there's ways to handle that. And if you set it up that way, the FPJ synthesis tool does all the timing for you. You don't have to mess with setup and hold times. You don't have to worry about whether the design is, is having shoot through issues or not. It's, this tool takes care of it because it knows its own delays of its own components. But you have to use the clock enables. If you create your own clocks, you're going to create clock skew and you're going to create timing problems. I'm dealing with this on the design right now because I've, we imported a bunch of stuff from off uh, open course and they weren't built to the uh, clock enable model. So we're having to go through and go, okay, no, this should be an enable. Let's rewrite this. It's um, be careful with open cores because there's a lot of stuff like that on it. And if you want to bring in, a, especially very complex modules like uh, UARTs with FIFO, full handshaking and state control and all of that, uh, look to see if they have clock enable inputs for their cells. Okay. Um, and I was giving an example here. If you need a uh, clock divider, what you could do is just make a counter that's also a clock enable and the output of the counter is an enable for the any downstream logic that's going to use the master clock. When you get used to that technique, it really all falls out and the timing synthesis gets done and you build it and it's stable. You can port it, you can port it to different speed grades, the synthesis tool takes care of it, you can go to bigger devices, smaller devices, it'll work out the timing relationship for you. Uh, you do you generate the clock yourself and you're kind of throwing all that out the window so please don't do that all right um let's see also if you're doing buses 
I see this a lot too. Uh, I'm, I build a UART and here's my UART input. Here's a data bus. Just write me something. All right? Or it's got an output. Here's an output. Just read me something. Um, especially with bus interfaces, if you do designs that are just like you're tied up with that peripheral for how long or whatever it's, tr for whatever it's trying to do, you could be delaying your micro unnecessarily. Like uh, one thing we're doing on the S100 bus is a write through concept where the bus interface for the S100 bus receives the write from the processor on chip and just receives it. It doesn't, it hasn't started any state cycle on the S100 bus yet, but it takes the data. The micro can go off to its next instruction as long as it's not out on the bus. <laughs> And it can then uh, the bus interface then does the write, and the only time it has to worry about it is if there's it's busy when it tries to do the next write. <laughs> so that's the transaction model. If you build interfaces inside the FPGA on a transaction model basis, it'll be a whole lot easier to bolt them together later without having timing interactions. Um, it just and it'll make it faster. Um, so I think that was it. Shall we start questions? Anyone who has questions, please line up at this microphone. I'm going to need some water now. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just wanted to add something. Um, mm -hmm. just, I've got a similar experience to your background. Great presentation, by the way. I just wanted mm -hmm. to emphasize return path over signal path, or mm -hmm. as much as signal path. I see a lot of engineers not realizing that you know electric circuit is an electric circuit. It goes in a loop. <laughs> Any signal yeah. current has to come back as ground current. And just to pay attention to that, you know, lots of ground vias. I even see experienced engineers doing things like creating a 20-pin connector and assigning 19 of them to signals in one ground, which <laughs> like, blows Are my you mind. referring to the S100 bus now? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, just as you know, if you're doing PCV design, just pay attention to how the current's going to get back to the point of origin. Yeah. And, but, yeah, you cover that a little bit in RF, but otherwise... Thanks. Well, I did, and mostly what I was uh, the reason I didn't emphasize it more is the buses when they made them, they were low frequency. I mean, what was the Apple bus running at? Two megahertz? IBM bus is 4.77. The ground currents were there. Yes, they created problems, but they weren't a snow, snow shock. Ah, so, <laughs> I have a long shake. It wasn't a showstopper for them. But if you look at what happened after that PCI, look at the count the grounds on a PCI connector sometime. <laughs> Oh, sorry. I mean, even on like the PC bus, there's, you know, what, 62 signals on the 8 bit ISA connector and three grounds. Yeah, same so. thing. So, on the subject of termination, could you expand a little bit about incident wave and reflected wave? Uh, because the point you made on the slide was that these reflections are not reflections off of the end of the bus because impedance mismatch and more due to load driving, and yet the gentleman here, I apologize, I don't know his name, mentioned PCI. That use, according to the sheets that I've read, is reflected wave. You are deliberately reflecting off of the end of the bus. It's a matter of the frequency. It's a matter of the frequency domain. Uh, the, why I was referring it to that way is the common stuff we're dealing with, 10 megahertz stuff. It's not, and the capacitive load. Uh, anybody here know how much capacitance is in 10, 10 TTL loads? About 100 puff, 100 picofarads. All right, that's a lot of load capacitance when you think about it at, for an edge transition, right? If a PCI bus had 100 picofarads of load on any particular clock circuit, you'd kill it. It can't sustain it, right? So they're going for higher frequencies by reducing the loads. So that's a different regime. They're going to the higher frequencies also bring the wavelengths in, so they got to be more careful about the incidence waves in those cases because, uh, what, uh, 66 with double data rate on some of that, yeah, you're getting into uh, VHF, UHF frequency ranges. And, yeah, for that size of bus, you'll start seeing it. My point was more about the common retro stuff in the uh, sub-100 megahertz, sub-10 megahertz range where the reflected incidence is just really swallowed up by the capacitance load it's there um the most of that waveform where you're seeing the bounce on a classic machine it's really due, due to the overcharging of the bus capacitance rather than an insensitive wave reflecting back okay thank you you're welcome and that's by the way that's the one that i get into fights with the classical engineers all the time <laughs>
but it's anyway. So you were referring to like creating your own clocks earlier, not to do it. Yeah. Um, on the FPGA itself, because I'm like looking at dev boards and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, if I've got a particular clock rate that I need the thing to run at, say I've got a dot clock of 28 megahertz or something like that. Okay. And the device itself has an, on, has an onboard clock at 27 megahertz. Is that something that the PLL can take care of for me or do I need to provide an external clock circuit for that? Okay. Uh, so most of these devices do allow multiple clock domains. So like the finished device I'm using has three different PLLs to handle multiple clock domains. And it even has PLLs that can take reference inputs externally and sort of sync with uh, non-standard clocks, right? So it is possible to have more than one clock. Um, what you want to do, though, is if you want to just do it on one, if you have a 27 megahertz, you probably multiply it up to a high frequency. Uh, and then divide it back down. The highest it goes is like 1600 megahertz or something. And then do a fractional divide down. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Um, two uh, two questions. Uh, the first is real quick. Are you going to make your uh, your slide deck available? Because uh, yes, there's so much uh, I'd love to uh, to look into with that. Yeah. So you covered so much. Um, oh. I'm sure there's some incomplete information in this thing too, just to the length. But yes, I'll provide. If you would provide me with uh, email, um, I'm going to go back to my booth. I can still write stuff down, or just capture me here, and we'll like trade uh, email addresses or something. I will send it out. Sure thing. And then the other thing is, yeah. um, there's there's starting to be a movement for hobbyists to create ASICs now, like uh, the tiny tape out yes. project. If you've yes, yes, I've seen that. How how much more difficult is it to design ASICs over uh, FPGAs? Okay. So it depends on the tools, and honestly, I have not looked at their tools yet. Um, the designs I see people producing are very simplistic, so I don't know what the boundaries are in terms of how they can handle high frequency, how they can handle clock uh, alignment across logic cells and things like this. I'd have to look at it a little bit closer. Uh, if you want to do this evaluation yourself, what I would basically do is see if you can get the tool chain, see, see what it asks for as input constraints. And if it's not asking for the right questions on the design, maybe, you know, uh, send them a question about it. You know, how would I implement a 400 megahertz DDR interface or something? They probably aren't at that stage with that technology, though, to be honest. Thank you. You're welcome. This question is just for fun. Um, That's why we're all here. <laughs> there's a uh, story I uh, heard about FPGAs a number of years uh, around, around uh, at least 10, I would say, that um, I wondered if... Um, was still a uh, common thing that had been developed and uh, still done, since, if you had heard. And it's um, they had uh, randomized the FPGA configuration and basically done what I would call similar to training a GAN and AI. And they kept improving the uh, result until the FPGA somehow figured out how to calculate a parabola well it, and it uh the the layout that it came up with uh couldn't be transferred to an identical unit because it was uh emitting uh frequencies that were uh related to the tolerance of uh the individual unit right the manufacturing tolerance of the device um I don't know that particular study, but I've seen similar ones that have done iterative iterations to find the optimized logic. Um, it's usually not the FPGA itself doing it. There's an external factor that's building weights and measures off each iteration and adjusting outputs to try to uh, converge on a solution. Um, I don't know that I call that AI. I, I still have this problem with AI where it's basically, if you're building weights and measures and iterations, it's that's more just a an optimization engine in my opinion but um yeah i, I but said that's analogous what I, uh yes there are manufacturing tolerances between fpgas but that's what the synthesis tool takes into account right so if you were doing 
if it was doing it in conjunction with the synthesis tool, it should have done it in a way that it would have been uh, process buildable across all. But it sounds like it was just iterating on one particular device and, you know, I don't know how useful that is. <laughs> Is there like a good first like hello world style project for the FPGA for those of us that attended community college? Uh, I've used a few different ones. Um, one thing I do on boards that I've like I'm building for the first time and I just want to check the, the did everything reflow correctly and so on um, is I will try to wiggle every single output I can and I just do a big counter. So I can identify, okay, this one's working at uh, full rate, the next one's half rate, and go on down and just check all the pinouts, right? So it's, the device is live, I can program it, I can see it's wiggling outputs where I need them to wiggle. Um, the other thing I'll do is some of my boards, I have a couple of seven segment displays on it, and I'll put like postcodes there to indicate state of different internal logic. Uh, I'll sometimes do that during debugging of state machine logic on different uh, cells where it's like, I can either go in with the on-chip debugger, which is a little cumbersome to drill down layers into an FPGA, or I'll just have it print out or display its error state on an LED. Uh, do it either way. But the it's very much going to depend on what board the FPGA is on. You know, what do you have available as outputs? What can you use to signify a sign of life? What I have is a, a DE10 Nano. It's I'm sorry? DE10? A DE10 Nano. Have you heard of the Mister project? Yes, I have, but I haven't looked at the hardware it uses. I have looked at the uh, next eighty, next one eighty six, because I'm interested in putting it on one of the Phoenix boards. But I haven't really looked at much else. I guess starting from scratch, say you've written an emulator and you kind of interested in porting it to FPGA. Like, is that a six month project, a year? Or no? <laughs> um, you mean of your own design? Yeah. Uh, let's see. The last one I did. The, the longest time was not the design, but because I had it assembled. <laughs> um, one, okay, so if I was assembling for the S100 computers uh, group to replace an FPGA module that became unattainable during the shutdown. Uh, it took me a couple of months to do the design, and it took me about six months to get it th through assembly because of tariffs, because of... <laughs> Shipping delays, part component availability, stuff like that. Um, it depends on the complexity of design. Uh, if you just want to start playing with it, a lot of the manufacturers offer development boards that you can start building on, usually with some interfaces that might be close to what you're trying to interface to. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Okay, thank you for uh, putting up with an old engineer's blathering about <laughs> PCBs and FPGAs. Uh, I hope you all have good designs uh, that you enjoy. And uh, if you find me or you want to uh, talk to me further about it, I'll be happy to hear how you progress and uh, give any help I can. Thank you.